and he. And we know Flipper lives in a world full of wonder, lying there under, under the sea. This video is brought to you by Patreon. Patreon, chicken of the sea. At some point, it really is just part of the brand. We've talked many times about how daytime Nickelodeon utilized older television shows from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, how they were used to entice the nostalgic sensibilities of baby boomer parents. You know, the people who actually pay for the cable packages. We've talked about how these shows were brand synergy with our MTV network projects like Nick at Night and The Ha Channel, hoping to draw eyes to these other stations. We've talked about how they were used in multimedia promotional projects for things like the 80s Monkeys revival. But if you do something enough times, it just becomes expected. When you tuned into Nickelodeon in 1990, you just expected to see a few time slots given to these retro TV shows. We don't need ulterior motives anymore, let's just find a show from the 60s that's kind of novel and not too outdated for modern kids. Let's just air something old and fun. Today's show wasn't a Nick at Night cross-promotional spot. It did air on Nick at Night, eventually, for a few weeks, six years later in 1996. But it was, first and foremost, a Nickelodeon show, aimed at kids who love animals and beaches and adventure. Premiering on Nick on August 6th, 1990, this is Flipper. Nick knows that a kid can never have too many pets, but when you've already got a superhero dog, a pretty cool cat, and a very dappy duck, the next pet you get is going to have to make a pretty big splash. That's why Nickelodeon has got Flipper, a dolphin whose destiny is underwater adventure, a mammal whose mission is kids. We're its best friend. Flipper, the splashiest member of the Nick Animal Gang. Take him for a walk in the water Saturdays at 1.30, 12.30 Central on the network that gives you what you want, Nickelodeon. Welcome to Coral Key Park, a marine preserve and vacationing destination in southern Florida. It's maintained by park ranger Porter Ricks, played by Brian Kelly, a no-nonsense single father who lives on the beach with his two sons, 15-year-old Sandy, played by Luke Halpin, and 10-year-old Bud, played by Tommy Norton. The two boys spend their days snorkeling, boating, and helping their father with various tasks around the park, like shooing away disruptive party-goers, or checking permits of local marine biologists, or taking on organized crime dumping evidence in the water. Yeah, it's never a dull day at Coral Key Park. Thankfully, Flipper is here to help. An intelligent, playful bottlenose dolphin, Flipper is kind of the pet of the Ricks family, playing catch and swimming with the boys when they're not in the middle of a terrifying adventure. And when adventure does come, Flipper is ready to help. Oh no, we dropped a box of blood we need for a life-saving transfusion into the ocean. Flipper to the rescue! Oh no, a scientist got stung by a venomous fish. Quick Flipper, go get help! Oh no! NASA has lost a space probe containing classified information and a spy has kidnapped Sandy to try and find it. Stick it to the commies, Flipper! The first time I don't have to stay by the radio, I miss all the fun. Fun? What fun? Tell him, Flipper! Flipper? What, what did the dolphin have to do with it? Well, that's a long story, Commander. Very long story. Other reoccurring characters include Hap, an old fisherman who likes to sit around and tell tall tales of his youthful adventures. He was played by Andy Devine, who you probably know as the voice of Friar Tuck for Disney's Robin Hood. Well, now that looks like a... Yeah, that looks like one of them old Spanish doubloons. It does? Yeah, it looks like one of the ones me and the Admiral found when we blew up that pirate ship off the coast of Jamaica. Then there was Ula, played by Swedish actress Ula Stromst, an oceanographer who always shows up in a cute little yellow submarine and has a little will-they-won't-they they chemistry with Porter Rick, though ultimately nothing comes of it. It would be nice to think that you would be thinking of me for the rest of the day. Well, that uh, won't be too hard to do, shall we? Oh, and Pelican Pete! He's a pelican! 
Running for three seasons for a total of 88 episodes, Flipper is a pretty classic boy and his pet adventure show in the vein of Lassie, just with a unique pet that informed every one of the program's creative decisions. Every single story had to have an aquatic element, no matter how silly that made things. Oh look, a traveling circus is in town. A oceanic traveling circus. Okay. And to be frank, there's a lot less you can do with a dolphin than with a dog. You can take a dog to different locations. Flipper is pretty much stuck to this beach with the occasional vacation to an aquarium or some wetlands. You aren't taking him mountain climbing. Dogs can emote better than dolphins. There's just a lot less performance from dolphins. Most of Flipper's actions are not seen by what the dolphin actually does, but in what the edit implies. From concept alone, Flipper is a much more limited show than many of its contemporaries. It makes up for it by being absolutely gorgeous. A love letter to sand and palm trees in the open ocean. A lot of this show takes place on boats, and while there are elements of rear screen projection, especially when guest stars are involved, the majority of these scenes are actually filmed for real, the actual actors on actual boats often giving us a hypnotic swaying effect as the boat the actors are on and the boat the camera is on bob up and down at different rates. And then there was the underwater filming, which had simply never been done on a color television scale before. Every episode finds an excuse for scenes of scuba diving, snorkeling, or personal submarines. This also meant a good many aquatic stunts, many of them performed by the actual actors. That Brian Kelly sure knows how to dive off a boat. It's a show of simple pleasures, action, adventure, nature, and dolphin stunts. And outside of a few fashion trends, there's not much here that dates it to the mid-1960s, making it a good pick for young contemporary audiences in 1990. But how did it come to be? For that, we can thank this guy. Riku Browning was born in Fort Pierce, Florida on the 16th of February, 1930. A talented swimmer, Browning ended up working at Wikiwachi Springs, one of the first water show attractions in the country, famous for its mermaid shows where performers would stay underwater for extended periods of time thanks to hidden air supplies. Wikiwachi Springs was founded by Newt Perry, another professional swimmer and promoter who was constantly bringing in film crews to shoot his acts for various newsreels. In 1950, one of these film crews showed up while Browning was working and asked for his assistance in collaborating their underwater cameras. They loved the location, the water and the clarity and everything. Their cameraman asked if I could swim in front of the cameras so they could get a perspective of the size of a human being against the fish and the grass. So I did. The film crew belonged to Universal International, and the film they were looking to make was The Creature from the Black Lagoon. Impressed with his capabilities, Universal hired Browning as the underwater performer of the film's titular creature, holding his breath for four minutes at a time while wearing heavy latex. Premiering in 1954, The Creature from the Black Lagoon was a success, and The Creature, or Gill Man, became the last of the classic Universal movie monsters. The film would get two sequels, Revenge of the Creature in 1955 and The Creature Walks Among Us in 1956, with Browning returning for the underwater Gill Man scenes in each one. For Browning, the doors to Hollywood had been opened. He would do diving and underwater stunt work for films like Disney's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and the television series Sea Hunt, an adventure show about scuba divers. And it was on Sea Hunt that Browning would make friends with producer Ivan Tors. A Hungarian immigrant, Tors had worked predominantly in the field of science fiction B-movies before trying to break into television. Sold his first-run syndication, Sea Hunt was the first show of its kind, mixing original underwater footage with stock footage to create 155 episodes of thrilling deep-sea action. Some of the shows, as an example, this is where Ivan's creativity comes in. We would film things that just happened. A DC-3 airplane crashed in the Bahamas, and we were going over to Nassau in our boat, and we stopped and filmed the DC-3 there, above water. And we had Courtney swim in and swim out, get on top and wave. We did, we did all kind of crazy things. 
and we sent that back to the studio. Well, then Ivan take that, and he'd write a show around it. Browning not only performed on the show, but by its second season was the show's underwater stunt coordinator. Sea Hunt ceased production in 1961. As Browning tells it, shortly after the show's cancellation, he walked into the living room to find his kids glued to the television. I came home one day, and my children were sitting in the living room watching Glassy. And so I sat down next to him, and I was watching it, and from things that have happened to me in the past with dolphins, I thought, why not do a show about a boy and a dolphin, like on the Greek coin? And uh, that stuck in my mind. So that was the beginning of, of getting something down on paper about Flipper. Initially, Browning thought this would only work as a book, so he got his brother-in-law, Jack Cowden, to help work out a plot summary, a tale of a son of a fisherman who befriends a dolphin off the Florida Keys. The father is grumpy about it and forbids this interaction, until Flipper saves the boy from an attacking shark. Unfortunately, no publishers seemed interested. Well, we had finished Sea Hunt, and I called Ivan. I said, Ivan, would you do me a favor? He said, what? And I said, we've written a book. It's called Flipper, and I'm trying to get it produced as a book. Can I say you as a producer are considering it as a movie? He said, OK, but send me a copy. And I called New York, and I said, uh, are you going to do this as a book or not? They said, well, we'll get back at you. Never heard from him. A few weeks later, I heard from Ivan. He called. He said, Rico, he says, I like the story. Let's make a movie. So then he got with MGM, got financing, and we made the first feature, Flipper. Movie stars have been discovered in many different places. In soda fountains, on Hollywood Boulevard, and right on the sets of the studios. But now for the first time, a glamorous new star has been discovered in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It's Flipper, the fabulous dolphin. It was an underwater adventure story, which Ivan Torres was well versed in, had all the industry connections for. Sure, it was a lassie ripoff, but that just meant it would probably make more money. And it was pretty wholesome. And Torres was worried that wholesome family entertainment was disappearing. In 1961, Torres had testified in front of the US Senate's Juvenile Delinquency Committee on NBC trying to force in unwanted amounts of sex and violence into Sea Hunt. We have no excuse to make any kind of shows only because they are profitable. I think we have a tremendous responsibility. When I see more and more of my children grow up, and I see how they are adversely affected by TV viewing. Lassie But Dolphin was exactly the kind of project Torres was looking for at this time. It didn't go to television screens right away though, but instead Torres decided to test the waters with a feature length film. Flipper the movie began production in 1962 and was released in theaters on August 14th, 1963, distributed by MGM. And it was a solid success, making about $5 million against the film's meager $500,000 budget. Torres took that success forward immediately, getting both a film sequel and a television follow-up greenlit for 1964. Luke Halpin as Sandy Ricks was the only actor to appear in all three installments. In the transition from film to television, Sandy would have his father recast, he would lose his mother, and suddenly gain a younger brother out of nowhere. They didn't invent continuity until the 70s, you see. Flipper's new adventure premiered in theaters on June 24, 1964, and the television show premiered on NBC a mere three months later, on September 19, 1964. Now, for the original 87-minute film, which only really needed a bit of dolphin acting, Dolphin handling duties were spread out. There was Milton Santini, a fisherman turned porpoise and dolphin trainer who specialized in catching dolphins for zoos and aquariums, and Santini's own pet, Mitzi, became the film's primary dolphin actor. And even Riku Browning himself seemed to get along really well with the film's aquatic stars. How do you get a dolphin to swim for 50 feet underwater in front of a camera? Solution? Riku got in the water with them. He wasn't looking down on them. They were on the same level, making eye contact. That sounds simple, but it had never been done before. When I first saw Rico doing it, I was amazed. However, for a television show, the production would need much more dolphin footage and a larger variety of dolphin tricks. And for that, it would require more dolphins. Six to be exact. Five females, 
Susie, Kathy, Patty, Squirt, and Scotty, and one male, Clown. Female bottlenose dolphins tended to be less aggressive than males, making them easier to work with, and also meaning they had less scars from fights. We can't have a busted up dolphin on our show. The one male dolphin was there just because he could do a very specific swimming backwards trick. With all this extra work and all these extra animals, a dedicated dolphin trainer was needed. Enter Rick O'Berry, a dolphin trapper and trainer for the Miami Seaquarium. I would get the script and it says, Flipper goes over to the dock and picks up the gun and then swims down left to right. I had to actually translate that. The house that you see in the Flipper set where the family lived was actually my house. I lived there all year round for seven years. And right in front of the house, it was a lake saltwater lake and, and that's where Flipper was at the end of the dock. When Flipper came on television on Friday night at 7.30, I would take my television set from the house and go down the end of the dock with a long extension cord and Kathy would watch herself on television. Something to take into account was that dolphin training was very, very new. While dolphin capture and exhibition had been around since the 19th century, the actual methods of taming and teaching tricks were developed in 1949 by Adolf Fraun, a Ringling Brothers animal trainer that had been hired by Marine Land of Florida to see if it was even possible. The technique Fraun came up with was very simple and very much within the circus mindset. Just starve the poor thing. In training a dolphin, the main pressure we use is hunger. To put it simply, the hungrier they are, the better they learn. If they're not hungry, there's no way to teach them anything. There's more to it than that, but not much more. One major issue was in transporting the dolphins back and forth from shooting locations. Unlike most mammals, you can't sedate a dolphin because their breathing is actively controlled. It's not an automatic function like it is for humans. Dolphins are always conscious, even in sleep, and if you were to tranquilize one, it would simply stop breathing and die. This was even a plot point in an episode of the show. How soon will that stuff knock him out? He'll be all right. You don't understand, Mr. Courtney. Dolphins don't sleep underwater. If he doesn't surface to breathe air, he's gonna drown. So you can't medically calm the animal for transport. The dolphins were moved around using an 8-foot long rubber box lined with water-filled sponges, which initially caused panic among the animals. There are far too many times in the show where Flipper is beached or being moved out in the ocean in ways that could not have been pleasant for the animals. The very first episode sees Flipper loaded up on a helicopter and dropped back into the ocean mid-flight. There's nothing here that required a real animal. A model would have been fine, but... Nope, there she is, dried out on a loud machine before being shoved out. I don't want to give the impression that there was proactive animal abuse going on. It's not like there was a guy with a bullwhip off camera striking the dolphins when they messed up a trick. This was more a case of general ignorance as to what these animals could do, what they were built to do, using techniques that were barely 15 years old. A lot of the problems here are more obvious in hindsight, but they were problems. We'll touch back on this in a bit. The people making the show did care. They were very passionate. Riku Browning started to learn directing with several episodes of the show, including the episode that brought his life's work together in one spectacular half hour. It's the match of the century. The battle you've all been waiting for. It's Flipper versus the creature from the Black Lagoon. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, they didn't have the rights for THE creature, but that is Browning in a knockoff Gilman costume in a story about a film crew making an underwater monster movie and the belligerent director plotting to get rid of Flipper after the dolphin accidentally ruins a shot. Flipper the TV show was a success, but it had a lot of the same problems as Lassie. Luke Halpin, who carried two movies and three seasons of television with his performance as Sandy, was approaching his 20s and Tommy Norton was going through puberty, so the childhood audience surrogate element of the show would soon be gone. 
In the same way that Lassie was passed on from Jeff to Timmy on his show, Flipper would have to make some new friends. In the two-part season three finale, titled uh, Flipper's New Friends, we're introduced to the Whitman family, a single mother with her two children, Dirk and Liz. The child actors aren't that great. So what? They'll all be in cages. It's a park, isn't it? Besides, we'll have Rick with us. At the end of it all, Sandy joins the National Guard, Bud goes off to private school, and Dirk and Liz becomes Flipper's new best friends, presumably with season four being about their adventures. Season four never came, and Flipper aired its last new episode on April 15, 1967. The dolphins returned to their various aquariums, and the cast and crew spread out into the winds. The obvious next step was cashing in on Flipper's success. Everyone loves Flipper, and if they love Flipper, maybe they'll love other animal-based shows the same way. Ivan Torres spent much of the rest of his career making animal-based movies that served as pilots for animal-based TV shows. There was Clarence the Cross-Eyed Lion, which would spin off to the show Doctari, Gentle Giant led to Gentle Ben, and Africa, Texas style became Cowboy in Africa. Independent of tours, Riku Browning also attempted this in 1973, stepping into the director chair for the film Salty, which is just Flipper, but a sea lion this time. Like Flipper before it, the film was immediately followed by a TV show. It didn't catch on, and Browning stopped trying to make Lightning Strike twice, spending the rest of his career as a second unit director for any project needing underwater shots. Oh, except for that one time Browning made an exploitation movie called Mr. No Legs about a mob hitman with a tricked out wheelchair. This has nothing to do with Flipper, but I couldn't not bring it up. At the time of this recording, Riku Browning is still with us, making him the only still-living Universal Monster actor. Rick O'Berry continued his work as a dolphin trainer until around 1970, when he was called in to check in on Kathy, one of the original Flipper dolphins. She had started acting strange, lethargic, but not obviously sick. She was black from sunburn because she spends most of her time on the surface of the water. Her fin was bent, just like Keiko's. That's why they're bent, gravity. That's nature saying there's something wrong here. They travel underwater where there's no gravity. And so uh, she swam over and looked me right in the eye, took a breath, and just held, you know, just held it. Well, uh, she sank to the bottom of the tank. Uh, I jumped in and uh, pulled her to the surface. She committed suicide. The tank, <laughs> the tank is a bad thing. Since then, O'Berry has devoted his time to dolphin advocacy and rescue, founding the Dolphin Project in 1970 to educate the public on the harm captivity has on the animal. He has also staged a great number of protests and has been arrested a number of times for attempting to rescue and release captive dolphins. It's been a mixed bag. I'm all for the advocacy, but most of the rescued animals ended up acclimated to the point where they could no longer survive in the wild. This is a sad fact of most animals in captivity. Consider Free Willy, a post-flipper franchise that's, ironically, about releasing captive animals into the wild. This inspired a write-in campaign to release its main orca actor, Keiko, who had been living in poor conditions before and through the film's production. Warner Brothers took the opportunity to spin some good publicity with the Free Willy Keiko Foundation, and in 1999, the animal was released around Iceland. It did not go well, with Keiko being unable to integrate with wild orcas and dying just a few years later. 
Unfortunately, this same thing largely holds true for dolphins, and it would backfire hard on O'Berry. The highest profile incident of this came in 1996, when O'Berry and his team released two dolphins that had been part of a training program for the United States Navy. The dolphins were later found maimed and starved, and had to be recaptured to save their lives. These dolphins were injured, needed medical attention, and could have died. This incident underscores the need to conduct any dolphin release scientifically and with follow-up to ensure the health and welfare of the animals. Prior to the release, we repeatedly warned these individuals of the risks inherent in releasing dolphins without a scientific research permit. They agreed to apply for a permit, but didn't, and released the dolphins without one. A scientific research permit, if used, would have facilitated the development of a responsible release protocol. While I'm with O'Berry in spirit, in practice he has been far too careless and self-important for his own good. In 1995, a new Flipper series premiered on first-run syndication, starring a young Jessica Alba. It had nothing to do with the original series, outside of starring a dolphin named Flipper. In 1996, Universal Pictures released a direct remake of the 1963 film. Starring Paul Hogan and Elijah Wood, the film got a lot of coverage on Nickelodeon, a bit of brand synergy. Five, four, three, and now it's two, time for one. a Nick exclusive with Elijah Wood. I've always wanted to work with dolphins firsthand, train them, be in the water with them. And it was a learning experience for me. I learned a lot about the dolphins. There's two noises that it makes. Um, there's, it, it, it whistles out of its blowhole. And it, it makes kind of like a <laughs> noise once in a while. And then also, it does a, a really high-pitched kind of squeak, like... There's actually a lubricant that comes off of the skin. There's glands that make this lubricant, and that's actually what makes them go fast in the water. It's kind of an oil. I got to know all the dolphins really well. I became friends with them and stuff. It was awesome. It's kind of like a dream come true. Universal Pictures Flipper, starring Elijah Wood, coming to a theater near you this Friday. Finally, in 1999, for Australian television, there was the animated Flipper and Lepaka, which uh, takes the franchise in some out there directions. A Polynesian boy who can talk to animals, an advanced underwater civilization, dinosaurs. We've come a long way from Flipper stopping lobster poachers. And then the 21st century rolled around, and, uh, we kind of stopped doing this kind of stuff. As the years have gone on, the general public have become more aware of the harm industries that contain aquatic mammals cause. I feel somewhat responsible because it was the Flipper TV series that created this multi-billion dollar industry. It created this desire to swim with them and kiss them and hold them and hug them and love them to death. And it created all these captures. Rick O'Berry featured prominently in the Academy Award-winning 2009 documentary The Cove about Japan's dolphin fishing industry. In 2010, an orca at SeaWorld killed one of its trainers in the middle of a show, leading to another high-profile documentary, Blackfish, in 2013. The reputation of places like SeaWorld have been on a steady decline ever since. As such, the space for these kind of shows and movies have disappeared. The Flipper franchise is dead has been since 2005 with the final episode of Flipper and Lepaka. And if Flipper is ever revived, it almost certainly won't be with an actual dolphin. Maybe an animated show, or a movie with a CGI animal. Heck, we don't even have dogs anymore in our dog and his boy movies. There's just too much baggage, too much common knowledge as to the harm these kind of productions can produce. A trained dolphin show just isn't going to gain the right kind of traction right now. So with all this in mind, how do we approach the classic Flipper show for modern viewing? As far as my coverage of retro baby boomer shows for Knickknacks goes, Flipper has very little in the past was a mistake category. Ivan Torres' desire to make some wholesome family adventure entertainment without excessive violence and titillation results in a show that has little in the way of dated gender roles or racist stereotypes. Compared to most things of this vintage, Flipper has aged pretty well. It was agreeable television in 1964, it was agreeable television in 1990, and I'd say it's still agreeable television in 2022. Except for the larger dolphin issue. 
While many, myself included, believe that containment is inherently abusive for aquatic mammals like dolphins and orcas, that was not as fully understood at the time, and there's no signs of any direct abuse towards the show's animal stars. There are stunts that, in retrospect, make you go, oh, wow, maybe they shouldn't have gone that far, but they weren't making these animals jump through hoops of fire. I do believe that most of the cast and crew cared deeply for these animals. Most of the plots concern issues of nature preservation, with many villains of the week being poachers and vacationers that don't respect the ocean. Marine biologists are all over the place. You can't go five feet without stubbing your toe on one, and I'm sure, I'm 100% positive, that this show inspired many future marine biologists. Flipper's Great Sin was popularizing a form of animal entertainment that was a result in a great deal of exploitation and abuse. Would places like SeaWorld have caught on without the mainstream popularity of Flipper? Maybe, but it would have had to have worked a lot harder to get there. Is that enough to dismiss the show entirely? For me, this is what I call the vegetarian versus pepperoni pizza conundrum. So say you're a vegetarian or a vegan, and you're at a party at a friend's house, and your friend has bought a pepperoni pizza. You did not pay for this pizza. You did not create a demand that required the exploitation and death of certain animals to make that pepperoni. All the material harm this pizza could cause, it has already caused, and you can't reverse that. Is it okay then to eat a slice of that pizza? That's an entirely personal question. For many, the answer is going to be a flat no. They can't stomach the idea and wouldn't touch the results of animal harm. But for some, the answer is, well, this battle is already lost and pepperoni pizza is very tasty, so why not? Flipper is a very tasty pepperoni pizza and it's up to you if you want a slice. Nickelodeon ran Flipper all the way until July 27th, 1996, ending the show less than two months after the release of the Paul Hogan movie, which barely made back its budget. Nick was post all that by that point. It had more than enough original productions to fill the airtime, and a dated dolphin show with a tie-in movie that didn't do too well probably wasn't needed. If you want a slice of that Flipper pizza, it's a pretty easy show to find today. The entire series is available on DVD and Blu-ray, and at the time of this writing, you can watch it for free on Pluto TV, albeit in the wrong aspect ratio. Speaking personally, while Flipper wasn't one of my must-watches, I definitely caught several episodes on Nickelodeon during my childhood, and there is an undeniable summer breeze quality to it that makes it endearing. However, it's no longer a show I can believe in. Being a good person in this world is tricky. It's hard not to cause harm accidentally, bumbling into invisible systems. The best we can do is learn about the world and try to do better tomorrow than we did yesterday. Nick, 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 Next time, from retro live action to retro cartoons, who doesn't love a little UPA? Today's research shout-out goes to Behind the Dolphin Smile by Richard O'Berry, the nearest thing to a behind-the-scenes book Flipper got. O'Berry is a complicated figure, but his recollections are valuable and largely generous to the cast and crew of the show. I recommend it. Thank you all for watching. If you'd like to support Knickknacks and other Pop Arena projects, consider contributing to my Patreon. Every dollar goes to production values, research materials, and, let's be real here, medical bills. You can also support the channel by liking the video, leaving a comment, subscribing, hitting that bell icon for notifications, following me on Twitter, sending a one-time donation through PayPal or Coffee, and sharing knickknacks with all your friends. I'll see you next time, and remember, Black Lives Matter. <laughs>